Hi guys. Well, it's actually an exciting night, an exciting Saturday night here in Doomsday Trailer, which would be, I think, April 6, 2024, but we're going to pretend like it is Sunday morning. I have to get out of here early to do some more planet-eating real estate investing. So as long as I have nothing else to do with my life on Saturday night, I'm going to pretend like it's Sunday morning and bring you a good old-fashioned doomsday sermon. I am doing something I have not done in two years. Two years since uh, I have read a book. Uh, two years since I've actually had one of these strange things that are made of paper. And I want to thank my dear sweet sister, my my Georgia girl sister for sending me this fine book uh, called Drifting into Darien, A Personal and Natural History of the Altamaha River, which is in Georgia. And this is written by uh, not a doomer chick, but a, uh, an apocalyptic Georgia girl herself, Janice, J-A-N-I-S-S-E, Janice Ray, and uh, talking about this river that nobody has ever heard of, the uh, Altamaha River in Georgia. So I am going to read about half of this chapter where not that much directly about the Altamaha River in this chapter. But in this chapter, uh, Janice Ray is going to educate us about the U.S. forest disservice, and then we're going to talk about biomass. Uh, this is the single best uh, rant I have ever heard about biomass, and then we're going to send this to Bill McKibben. I've heard that Bill McKibben, after Planet of the Humans came out, has reconsidered his stance on biomass, but uh, we're going to hear what Johnice Ray has to say about it. But let's start out with uh, her uh, talking about the U.S. Forest Service, at least in the state of Georgia. And this book was written in 2013, so some of the information is dated, but anything we're getting ready to hear <coughs> has only gotten a hell of a lot worse than it was uh, 11 years ago. And speaking of worse, I might have to uh, I might have to put on two pairs of glasses. Hey, do you know you guys can do this? You can you can actually with these reading glasses from the dollar twenty five tree. You you can actually put them on top of each other. So like if you have a two and a half, and you put two of them together, you get a five. <laughs> so anyway. The, the aging process is not for pussies. But anyway, take it away, Janice Ray, and tell us about the U.S. forest disservice and biomass. <clears throat> Folks, we have us a problem. Scientists have spent a long time studying and deduced the fact that any of my neighbors could have told them already. A river is only as healthy as the forest along it. That means the Altamaha River is in trouble because we are cutting its forests to death. You know by now how attached I am to this watershed. It created me. Its water flows in my bones, which are composed of minerals the river bore down from the Appalachians. My history is here, as is my present, and likely my future. So when Malcolm Hodges showed me the map that had our forest blood all over it, 
like a big blood pudding with a river running down the center, I had to find out more. I tried to find some forest figures that are clear cut, so to speak. I went to the U.S. Forest Service. The people some of you might assume would be in charge of keeping our forest in good working order, but who are actually the management office for cutting them down. And I asked about statistics. It turns out that the Southern Research Station in Asheville, a unit of the Forest Service, has been counting and measuring trees in Georgia for a few years. The scientists there told me that as of 2004, 20 years ago, Georgia had the most forest cover of any state in the South, <coughs> with 67%. 67% of the state is forest. Something's not right, I told one of them. I live in Georgia and not in any city, and I bet you my grandpa's $20 gold piece that 67% of Georgia is not forest. Oh, yes, ma'am, it is, the scientist said. I'm telling you, I said, this state is not two-thirds forest, no matter how you crank the numbers. According to our definition, it is. What's your definition, I asked, and I was referred to a website at the Southern Research Station's Forest Inventory and Analysis for Georgia. <coughs> Forest land, according to the U.S. Forest Service Georgia fact sheet, is, quote, land at least 10% stocked by forest trees of any size <coughs> or formerly having had such tree cover, close quote. Whoa, stop there. What is 10% stocked? Does that mean that if you own 10 acres and one of those acres has trees on it, the entire 10 acres is a forest? And excuse me, when they say stocked, I think of a fish pond. We're talking about sacred places where St. Bernard promised wisdom is found. You will find something more in woods than in books, he said, and he did not mean an empty logging truck. Let's get back to the tract I asked about. If that one acre in question formerly had trees on it, the entire piece is still a 10-acre forest? All this time, I've been thinking a forest was something else. I thought a forest was a thick growth of trees covering an extensive tract of land. I thought a forest held trees of all kinds and ages, sapling to old growth, and among those trees were buco underbrush, shrubs and wild flowers, and among all that flora lived drifts of birds and crashes of animals and ambushes of insects and schools of fish. I was thinking like Rabindranath Tagore, whoever the hell that is, quote, trees are the earth's endless effort to speak to the listening heaven. And again, like Saint Bernard, quote, trees and stones will teach you that which you can never learn from masters. I was thinking about never seeing a poem as lovely as a tree, and I am telling you 67% of my state is not the earth trying to speak to the listening heaven. Most of it is made of, of places for the devil to hide. The government 
meaning the Forest Service, had more definition. It said that a piece of land, furthermore, might be at least an acre in size to be called a forest, and forest strips must be at least 120 feet wide. Okay, that's good. That means my front yard cannot be classed, at, classed as a forest, but the minimum requirements are a bit low, don't you think? What on earth is a forest strip? Like a chicken strip? The forest strip primeval? And forest strips? Ancient as the hills? So, the kind of trees on the land doesn't matter? That was me asking the you know, guy at the Forest Service. No, a tree is a tree, said the forestry scientist at uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I am no scientist, but I know that there's a tree and then there's a tree. I can take you to a place deep in the swamp and show you a tree. Let me know when you want to go. I don't mean to be rude, but I don't understand why we call you guys the Forest Service. This sounds like the Forest Disservice. At least I've found the problem. The people who are counting what forest we have left are fudging. They're warping the rules. They're making something sound better than it is. I found a table called Average Annual Timberland Disturbances. <clears throat> Disturbance, it seems, is the word used for death. Some of the disturbances are human caused, and these are termed treatments. Treatments include final harvest, which sounds a hell of a lot like clear cutting to me. The government salaried timber barons don't even have the guts to call clear cutting by its real name. They call it final harvest, or they call it even-aged timber management, a screwball takeoff on uneven-aged timber management. That one really makes me angry. Uneven-aged timber management is the only kind of ecological timber harvesting I know. It means going into a forest and selecting individual trees for cutting. Trees that are diseased, leaning too close to other trees, which is what I am doing. I, I actually read this while I was uh, disturbing, while I was treating my piece of forest in Florida. <clears throat> free of endangered animals and mature. It's hard work, which most people want to avoid, and it's intelligent. Other government treatments are partial harvest, which translates to coming back as soon as the ground is dry enough, and thinning, which means the deer and turkeys have a few years yet. Just so you know, the average annual final harvest is 430,000 acres. Let me interpret this. 430,000 acres in Georgia annually are disturbed by a treatment that calls for even age management and ends in 430,000 acres of fricking 
clear cut. Amazing grace and follow the casket down the aisle. Yeah, though I canoe through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. May the circle be unbroken. Another 161,000 acres on average are sacrificed to partial harvest and 199,000 are thinned. That's what I am doing on my acre of land is thinning it. Something else about the mazes and tables concocted by the Forest Service confounds me. Of the 24.8 million acres in the state that are in forest cover, even if that means only 10% stocked or former forest cover or both, only six and a half million acres are in planted pine. That is 27% of all timberland. That makes no sense because I know what I know. I see what I see. Come on, people. You're saying only one-fourth of Georgia's forest are planted pine? A statement like that makes me almost blind with anger. What I want to know is, where are those 18.3 million acres of real forest? I've been looking for them a long time, and I want to see some of them. Here's an agency that hides its wrongdoing and protection of wrongdoers behind nuance, rhetoric, doublespeak, and skewed statistics. I could go on and on about the deceptions of the U.S. Forest Service when it comes to convincing us uneducated Southerners what's not going on in our woods. But if you take enough time and you read the tables closely enough, you'll see the holes. You'll see that the majority of pines in 2004 were nine inches or smaller in diameter and that pines larger than 20 inches in diameter are scarce as snowmen. Large cypress are almost non-existent. In 2004, University of California professor George Lakoff wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant know your values and frame the debate. Lakoff is a cognitive linguist. He studies the ways we use language in this country to manipulate, flummox, and hoodwink the American citizenry, and he tries to train his readers to look for the lingo one hand is waving a magic wand while the other slips a hundred dollar bill out of your pocket. We can see when people are using Orwellian language, but we should recognize, Lakoff writes, that they use Orwellian language precisely when they have to, when they are weak, when they cannot just come out and say what they mean. <coughs> My job as a writer then <coughs> is to present the facts. People think in frames, Lakoff writes, to be accepted, the truth must fit people's frames. If the facts do not fit a frame, the frame stays, and the facts bounce off." Close quote. So, let's frame this dialogue. And then she has a couple of more rants. She, uh, 
So she goes over to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and compares their figures and finds out that according to the DNR that uh, about one half of, uh, well, 33 percent of Georgia instead of 67 percent according to the DNR by their definition of a forest, and even that one's a little too uh, uh, optimistic. And then um, she, she, she does a rant about clear cutting, uh, which is certainly ramping up and guarantee you it's worse now than it was when she wrote this book 11 years ago. And then she goes off on a fine rant about, uh, about uh, wetlands, but uh, what I want to center on is her rant, uh, what is she doing, framing this dialogue where she takes on the biomass industry. This is the single best reading of the biomass industry, and it was a pretty nascent industry uh, in, in 2013, that the biomass industry, a hell of a lot more of the states of Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi, are being destroyed by the biomass industry than when she was writing this. <clears throat> Okay, you're writing this 11 years ago. Since we are talking about forest, I need to tell you about the latest assault. In the mid-2000s, I began to hear a term bandied about, biomass. It was an answer to climate change, which scientists increasingly feared would become runaway and a panacea to the scarcity of energy sources for the future. The timber industry, hurting from the recession in a depressed market, needed a new boom. Desperate for solutions, people, even some well-meaning and well-educated people, leapt on the biomass bandwagon. <coughs> Mostly what the industry was looking for were handouts from the government in the form of renewable energy credits. <coughs> that unencumbered government money, welfare checks for corporations, caused people to go a little mad. First, let me explain biomass. Biomass is organic material from living or recently living organisms which, through photosynthesis, stored energy from the sun. In common usage today, it is the cutting and burning of our forest and pine plantations to produce electricity. Biomass is incineration. It is a big, a really big burn barrel. Knowing nobody would want to live near an incinerator, the timber industry hid behind more obfuscation this time, gasification and pyrolysis, which are fancy names for burning things. <clears throat> the original sin is that government leaders at the Kyoto Conference, which sought to regulate greenhouse gas emissions globally, failed to embrace the fact that biomass is not carbon neutral. Global warming, 
or more aptly, climate disruption is caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping <clears throat> gases in the atmosphere causing warming of the globe. Here was a source of power that people came to believe did not contribute to climate change. An answer to prayers. I have sat in audiences where speakers touted biomass as carbon neutral. And she never talks about it as, but to this day, the United Nations continues to spew the bright green, unadulterated horseshit lie that, car that biomass is carbon neutral. A big, fat lie. The United Nations are a bunch of lying sacks of shit. Anyway, that's just my addition. Okay. I have sat in audiences where speakers touted biomass as carbon neutral. Excuse me? The Kyoto Protocol established reduction targets for fossil fuels, but not for other types of energy. Not for biomass, despite what the Kyoto Conference <coughs> overlooked and what industry declares, biomass will never be carbon neutral, no matter how anyone spins it. To the extent that carbon can be replaced by replanting forest, you know, that they have burned, <clears throat> The recapture will take decades. Burning wood or any other organic fuel will increase global warming. Add to this the ancillary <clears throat> emissions that come from production, harvest, use, and transportation of biomass. Anne Ingerton of Vermont, economist at the, with the Wilderness Society, has been studying the role of forest in climate change. She reports that far from being carbon neutral, biomass often releases more carbon than fossil fuels in the short term for a net loss of atmospheric health. Only a few types of wood can really come close to carbon neutrality. Waste that would have decomposed quickly anyway, if not used for energy. Perennial energy crops planted on abandoned farmlands or thinnings that reduce fire frequency or severity. The rest depends on the removal of live trees, which transfers carbon from the biosphere to the atmosphere. The slump of years represented by the time it takes a forest to regenerate, during which time most standing forest will have continued to absorb carbon will yank us ever more quickly toward a disastrous climate crisis. If a pine plantation containing 25-year-old trees is cut and burned, then we must wait 25 years and a day for it to be carbon neutralized. Note, because biomass releases more carbon than the natural gas or other fuel 
that would have been used instead, you do need to make up a bit extra beyond what you removed from the forest. Plus, you could lose some of soil carbon through harvest disturbances and that needs to be replaced as well. We cannot in this moment afford to put any more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In addition, Ingerson told me, the southeast is perhaps up for massive exports of wood chips and pellets to Europe in response to demand for carbon neutral energy in those countries. So when she was writing uh, this, this all-out assault on the southeast forest was barely cranking up uh, all of this stuff being sent to Europe. Uh, in response to demand for carbon neutral energy in those countries because climate <clears throat> regulations there, meaning in Europe, define biomass burning as carbon neutral and because nobody is responsible for reporting the emissions from ocean shipping of all of these millions of tons of wood chips across the Atlantic Ocean, <clears throat> nobody uh, is responsible for reporting the emissions from ocean shipping. We have a rather bizarre situation in that we are using lots of energy and depleting forest carbon in this country in order to meet illusory climate targets in another country. At the Georgia River Network Conference in, in 2010, I heard someone from the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy say, quote, energy is an important resource, particularly for baseload supply. For Georgia, for reducing many toxic air pollutants as well as greenhouse gas emissions. The speaker actually boasted that burning down our forest will reduce greenhouse gases as well as air pollution. You name me a wood fire that does not give off CO2 and I will eat a church pew. All wood and other organic materials contain carbon and burning them will confound the problem caused by greenhouse gases. The burning of biomass is a major source of harmful pollutants including particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, heavy metals, sulfur dioxide, and numerous carcinogens. Here is a partial list of pollutants that one biomass plant proposed for operation in Georgia applied for permission to release. Okay. Hydrogen chloride, mercury, arsenic, lead, formaldehyde, ammonia, carbon monoxide, acrolein, benzene, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, manganese, nickel, 
selenium, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, styrene, and metal air pollutants not identified. Hundreds of distinct hazardous byproducts are associated with biomass. To support biomass as a clean energy is an affront to the word. To call biomass alternative is oxymoronic. To say, to say this to my face is worse than slapping me. I would rather you blackened my eye. Yes, wood is in some ways is better than coal. Harvesting it doesn't destroy the Appalachians. Well, I, I don't know if she's toured the Appalachians regions, uh, recently. Thought to be the oldest mountains in the world. Wood does not leave the coal fields of West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama in wretched poverty, in ill health, dying, in fact, as utter hopelessness because not only are their communities being destroyed, so are their landscapes. Wood doesn't release as much sulfur dioxide as coal does. Remember, however, that incinerators release more carbon dioxide in stack emissions per megawatt of energy than coal plants. Incinerators typically emit more greenhouse gas per kilowatt hour than gas-fired plants. We need to get beyond incineration and combustion of all kinds. Incineration is what we are doing to the planet and we need to do less of it. Biomass is a weak-minded, money-driven, part-way solution to the most pressing problem we humans have ever had to face, which is the destruction of our very biosphere. By touting biomass, we artificially restrain viable alternatives and thus we limit our possibilities for lasting long-term solutions. As Joe, Johan Hari wrote about in his brilliant article, The Wrong Kind of Green, in the March 22, 2010 issue of The Nation, quote, You cannot jump halfway across a chasm. You still fall to your death. It is all or disaster. Biomass currently is more corporate welfare in the form of government subsidies destroying the last remnants of our native forests before our very eyes with no effects on mounting global temperatures and heightening weather catastrophes. Catherine Ling of Environment and Energy News reported on August 24, 2009 that, quote, the South could largely offset its growth in energy demands through 
2020 if a fully utilized cost-effective energy efficient uh, measures. Efficiency meaning using less, turning things off, unplugging shit. Efficiency technically could reduce demand by 2% per year, Lang said. But of course, as we all know, ain't gonna happen. Uh, anyway, I'm going to finish out this short chapter. In his essay, Walking, Thoreau wrote, quote, a township where one primitive, primitive forest waves above while another primitive forest rots below. Such a town is fitted to raise not only corn and potatoes, but poets and philosophers for the coming ages. In my lifetime, I have labored ceaselessly on behalf of the forest of the South, <laughs> hoping to show their demise and begin to see them restored. They have endured onslaught after onslaught, from turpentining to timbering the old growth, from chipping for pulp to tree farming. By 1995, the longleaf pine forest for example, which historically occupied 93 million acres of the southern coastal plain, were 99% gone. Less than 1,000 acres of virgin longleaf pine remains in the region. Few other ecosystems in this nation have suffered so egregious a slaughter of 190 plants associated with longleaf uplands, 122 are threatened or endangered. The animals associated with longleaf pine, gopher tortoises, red cockaded woodpeckers, Flatwoods, salamanders, northern bob white, bob white quail, Bachman sparrow, indigo snakes continue a staggering decline. They and others have the misfortune to join our pine flatwoods in their demise, which is a disappearance from the face of the earth. Even in my short lifetime, I have borne witness to this. With the loss of our forest, our rural economies suffer. We are exporting our jobs. Our communities suffer. Our cultures suffer our landscapes suffer, and our health suffers. We are suffering out here in rural Georgia. Do you understand that? Watching our landscape get shredded, chipped, pulped, reduced to muddy and torn up ground. And then she has one final rant on eucalyptus uh, that they're talking about. Uh, the, these goddamn eucalyptus forests being planting, being planted uh, in Georgia. But this story, drifting into Darien, is about a river. Let's go back 
to the cool shade of the Cypress and Tupelo Swamp. I'm doing my own research. Right now, as I write this, during late July, the temperature is 100 degrees on our porch. In the solar dehydrator, it is 128. But down at the river, under the black willows, the temperature is 10 degrees cooler, 90 degrees. Cut the trees and we mess up the world. Leave the trees. Keep the river. Keep the atmosphere. It is as simple as that. Thank you, Janice Ray, for uh, your many rants. Thank you for the education on the U.S. Forest Service Orwellian speak and say uh, fresh breath of fresh air about the bright green lie of biomass that is still uh, being promoted by the United Nations as a sustainable non-carbon producing renewable clean energy. One of the biggest, fattest, unadulterated, flat out lies of every bright green lie out there. <coughs> Biomass. <coughs> anyway, it looks like the Florida Department of Bio uh, of Forestry will not let me be burning my biomass, and so I'm seeing if I can send it to Europe, but uh, I have to figure out a way of. Uh, of grinding up my biomass. On my own little piece of uh, paradise. In a southern forest next to a drying up wetland. Bye, guys.